creation. As human population grows, more people move into the shadows of these dams, onto downstream floodplains, and potentially into the path of a devastating flood if one should fail. There is no such thing as a risk-free dam. All dams have some risk. The best conditioned dam, the best designed and maintained dams, they have low risk, and the ones that aren't well designed and have deficiencies certainly have higher risk, but there's no such thing as a risk-free dam. More than 100,000 dams now block U.S. rivers. Most were only designed to last 50 years, and one quarter have already passed their life expectancy. After decades of neglect, the American infrastructure is in crisis. Across the country, one in 10 dams is considered a threat to human life, and more than 13% of those are considered structurally deficient or unsafe. When they fail, they can fail badly, and they can put people in harm's way. The dam problem is probably the most significant in that it gives, in many cases, people little time to react. In small towns and big cities across the country, the possibility exists that a catastrophic failure could send millions of tons of water crashing through homes. If we have complete dam failure, you know, Berksville would no longer exist. It would be washed away. It's a serious situation that we need to plan for. And, uh, you know, we're, we're doing everything humanly possible to prepare. Emergency preparedness is essential for all communities living downstream of dams. And it's critical that resources be allocated to ensure that no dam, old or new, fails. The Army Corps of Engineers recently listed six of its dams as the highest priority for repairs. Making these dams safe is an expensive and time-consuming process but the cost of not being proactive could be worse. There would likely be loss of life downstream and certainly a lot of economic damages from the flooding. We estimate two to three billion dollars in economic damages downstream if this project were to fail. Nationwide, efforts are underway to identify dams at risk. Some are being removed. But over the next 10 years, more than a thousand dams will need significant repairs. Is it too late to prevent a major incident? I'm worried because every year we track the numbers in the United States, the number of unsafe and deficient dams. And we, again, we see this number going bigger and bigger and bigger, and there doesn't seem to be any um, slowing down of the increase of the number of unsafe dams. Getting older isn't the only thing that can make a dam unsafe. Most were designed before the risks of earthquakes and landslides were fully understood. An earthquake outside of Eugene, Oregon, could take out a series of dams that would send a wall of water estimated up to a billion tons. It's a late November morning sometime in the future. After days of heavy rain, the people of Eugene, Oregon are finally enjoying a sunny day. Suddenly, the ground starts to rumble, buildings shake, and people are terrified. In seconds, the shaking stops. It's an earthquake, magnitude 6.5. There's no serious damage, and everyone breathes a sigh of relief. But high in the mountains above the city, soil saturated by the rains is loosened by the quake, and landslides rush down the slopes into the reservoir of the Hills Creek Dam. Huge swaths of soil, trees, and debris flow into the rain-filled reservoir, creating waves that quickly overtop the earthen dam as the embankment gives out. Suddenly, more than 300,000 people in the valley below are in danger of being washed away. Americans have suffered the devastating consequences of a dam break before. 65 miles east of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, lies the town of Johnstown. It's situated in a valley just below the steep Allegheny Mountain Range. Here, two rivers, the Little Conemaugh and Stony Creek, join together to form the Conemaugh River a tributary of the Ohio River. At the end of the 19th century, Johnstown was a working-class town, feeding a booming America's insatiable appetite for steel. By 1889, there were 30,000 people sort of crammed into the valley. Just about everybody worked for the Cambria Iron Company. The whole prosperity of the valley really depended on the steel mill here in Johnstown. 14 miles upstream was the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club, an exclusive retreat for the Pittsburgh elite on the banks of an artificial lake. Starting in 1879, a group of rather wealthy and influential Pittsburgh area businessmen purchased the state's old reservoir and had the vision of turning the reservoir into a gentleman's fishing and hunting resort. 
the grounds included the dam, which held 20 million tons of water in the man-made Lake Konama. As purchasers of the property, the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club now owned and operated the dam. It was a uh, dam that had been built uh, almost 40 years earlier. And the original dam was well built. It hadn't been maintained. The club's agents had poorly reconstructed it and compromised all the safety features. So essentially, what you had was an accident waiting to happen. They lowered the top of the dam a few feet to build a carriage road, which certainly compromised the effectiveness of the dam. And the spillway was altered by the addition of screens that were designed to protect the club's very expensive collection of game fish. The club also, for some reason, elected not to replace the discharge pipes that were original to the structure. It was reckless. Uh, they were sort of oblivious to the consequences, and it's something that you'd certainly hope that would never happen today. Nearly 50 years of poor decisions and neglect might never have been a problem, but in late May 1889, Johnstown experiences two days of solid rain. The lake was rising about an inch every 10 minutes. As a result, the water just kept rising, getting closer to the top of the dams. And once the water went over the top, that pretty much doomed the dam to fail. Frantic efforts are made to shore up the dam, but it's too little too late. At 3.10 PM, the dam gives way at the center. It didn't really break, it just pushed away, and 20 million tons of water began an hour-long descent on Johnstown. By most accounts, it took about 45 minutes for the lake to disappear once the dam failed. Those who watched it happen, they were just absolutely stunned at what they were watching and horrified later to find out exactly what had happened. The torrent uproots huge trees, and in the narrow valleys, the flood reaches almost 90 feet above the river level. The small towns immediately below the dam are obliterated. Locomotives weighing 170,000 pounds are swept along for miles. By the time it reaches Johnstown, the flood is a 40-foot wall of debris. Within 10 minutes, four square miles of the town are destroyed. In its place, a churning lake 20 feet deep, topped by a crust of floating wreckage where survivors cling for their lives. On the far side of town, the rubble piles up against the stone bridge. It holds, but becomes another dam, forcing the water to rise and rush back into the city. And then the wreckage catches fire. Houses with their coal stoves burning caught the mass on fire. There, there were tank cars full of kerosene and oil that soaked down through the mass. That huge funeral pyre at the stone bridge burned for fully three days. 80 people who survived the initial flood were burned alive. As dawn rose the next morning, people began to make their way out of the flooded district. 2,209 men, women, and children had died. 99 entire families were wiped out, including 396 children. 124 women lost their husbands. 198 men lost their wives. More than 750 victims were never identified and are buried in the plot of the unknown in Grandview Cemetery. This was the biggest single day civilian loss of life in American history until 9-11. The Johnstown flood in many ways is symbolic of that whole era where America became a prosperous industrial nation, but there was a high cost environmentally and in terms of, you know, human suffering. America didn't learn a whole lot about dams. It took quite a few other tragedies to make the country more concerned about dam safety. It took another 75 or 100 years uh, for Americans uh, to start a national dam safety inspection program. Across the country, millions of people now live in the shadow of a dam. Many of these dams have the potential to fail with deadly consequences. In the simplest terms, a dam is an impervious structure that blocks the flow of water in a river or stream, holding the water behind it. 
Over the centuries, dams have been built from earth, stone, masonry, wood, and concrete. Dams are an important part of our daily needs. They provide water supply for the major metropolitan cities. They provide flood protection for millions of Americans, recreation for millions of Americans. They provide hydropower, renewable energy from hydropower. So they are a very important part of our daily life and infrastructure needs. They can also pose risks to those living downstream. Dams have long been a vital part of the nation's infrastructure, contributing to industrial growth, as well as making expansion to the beckoning arid west a viable reality. The Hoover Dam on the Colorado River between Nevada and Arizona was completed in 1935. It instantly became known as a world wonder, the largest electric power producing facility and largest concrete structure. A decade later, even the Hoover Dam is surpassed by the Grand Coulee Dam in Washington State. At 550 feet, it's taller and generates more power. But for all their grandeur, dams can also be a violent source of destruction. Dams are just extraordinary structures. And it's an incredible bit of hubris, really, on our part, that we think that we could take on such a force of nature as water, pile it up, and hold it back. There's probably 1,600 dams in this country that are over 100 feet tall, and there's 10,000 dams in this country that are large enough that are they're above population centers that if they should fail, we expect loss of life. While there has been a lot of enthusiasm for ribbon cutting, less interest has been shown in inspecting and maintaining what has already been built. During the 1970s, a string of high-profile dam failures cost hundreds of American lives and more than $1 billion in damage. On February 26, 1972, a badly maintained dam holding back waste from a coal mine broke in heavy rains. On June 9, 1972, floodwaters from a heavy rainfall overtopped the Canyon Lake Dam and it quickly failed. On June 5, 1976, the Teton Dam, built to modern standards, failed the first time it was filled with water. Experts were unable to determine what went wrong. On November 5, 1977, the neglected Kelly Barnes Dam failed, killing 39 students and staff at the Tocoa Falls College below. Finally, the government was moved to action. President Jimmy Carter issued an executive order that resulted in a national inspection program and the formation of the State Dam Safety Officials Association. These initiatives were commendable, but almost half a century later, the problems they were meant to address are still far from over. We do surveys every year of the states who have the responsibility of assuring the safety of dams, and their current uh, total for unsafe dams is about 3,300. Compounding. Population expanding and development booming, the late 20th century saw communities being built beneath dams and on floodplains across the U.S. Dams originally built far away from populated areas now have millions of Americans living in potential danger zones. The consequences of one of these dams failing includes loss of life. And that changes the standards to which this dam has to meet. We have dams in three categories based on the failure, high, significant, and low hazard. High hazard dam simply means that if it fails, it's likely to cause loss of life. And so we concentrate on these high hazard dams because they have such extreme consequences. According to the 2005 update to the National Inventory of Dams, more than 10,000 dams in the U.S. are considered high hazard. We have very large dams today that sit above cities that if they burst, would send a wall of water down and potentially drown that city. And if people can't get out of the way in the hurry, we face loss of life risk. We have structures that were designed for certain events, and sometimes Mother Nature raises the ante. We have to do whatever we can up front to try to prevent things from going wrong. But we also have to realize there are limits to what human beings can do when we're dealing with nature. The power of nature is a frightening memory for Lisa and Jerry Toops. Their family knows only too well the danger of living below a dam. Um, I was told later that the wave that came down was over 20 feet high that took out our house. December 2005. 
Jerry is the superintendent of the Johnson Shut-In State Park, 80 miles southwest of St. Louis. He lives in the park with his wife, Lisa, and their three children, Tanner, Tucker, and their only daughter, Tara. Above their house is a billion-gallon reservoir owned by a power company. It is filled with water at night and then drained during peak electricity times to generate power. We knew that if that reservoir ever broke, that we were going to be the first spot that would be hit. Um, there was an emergency action plan, and my husband had um, told me, he said, you know, if you ever get the call that the reservoir is broke, get out of the house and get up to the top of the hill. Early morning, December 14th, 2005, and during a routine fill, sensors that should prevent overloading the reservoir fail, and the water overflows the embankment. A wall of the reservoir collapses. No warning call ever comes. I was sleeping and I heard a loud rumbling sound. Um, I thought it was a tornado. It was very loud. Um, and I woke up and I immediately yelled, Jerry, get the kids. I heard her scream and I sat up in bed and I got about two steps on the floor and the whole house exploded around me. The water came in and that water was cold. It was 32 degrees outside that night. The family is suddenly fighting for survival in a rush of freezing water and debris. Jerry is separated from the rest and finds safety in a tree. I yelled for them in the tree and got no response, but the loudness of the water rushing by, I could barely hear my own screams. Lisa is holding on to her two boys, but can no longer see or hear her daughter over the rushing water. She's terrified help may not arrive in time to save them. Fire Chief Ben Meredith gets the emergency call, and when he finds the superintendent at the reservoir, Meredith learns it's completely empty. When I did get on the scene up here, it was definitely not what I was expecting. There's a lot more devastation than I ever dreamed of. There's water standing in every low-line spot, anywhere from eight, 10 foot deep water, just mud everywhere, trees, debris. It was just, just, just breathtaking. We located Jerry in the tree a little ways off the road, and we got him down out of the tree. At the edge of the tree line, Lisa and the boys are finally released by the receding surge. We proceeded farther up in the field, and that's when we found the rest of the Toops family. The last person to be rescued is the Toops' daughter, three-year-old Tara. They found her several hundred yards away from the house underneath a little cedar tree all curled up in a, a mat of just floating debris. The three children spend months in the hospital recovering from their injuries and hypothermia. Their physical injuries heal, but their home is gone. There was absolutely nothing left of the house. The only thing that there was was the cement foundation of the basement. It was completely destroyed. As devastating as the flood was, the events could have been much worse. It was fortunate that it was the winter time. We had campers the day before. We didn't have campers this day. If there had been people there, there would have been no way to warn them either. They would have been in the same struggle that we were all in. The campground has now been moved to higher ground. Removing the debris and restoring the park will take years. Jerry has now changed jobs within the Park Service, and the family no longer lives in the area. If you live below a dam, don't lose sleep over the dam breaking, but have a plan. And make sure your family knows the plan. Don't think that it's never going to happen to me, because it could. I pray that it doesn't but it could. In the generations of our parents and grandparents, great public works were a source of national pride. America wanted to be the first at doing this. The early 20th century belonged to America and engineering marvels such as the Hoover Dam and Golden Gate Bridge were testament to her dominance. We really relished engineering and we relished the accomplishment of these generations who put their courage, 
and their hearts and souls into building the infrastructure that made this great country great. But dreams realized in the last century are giving way to a new reality. Today, many great public works projects, dams and canals, bridges and tunnels, aquifers and aqueducts, even interstate highways are at or beyond their designed lifespan. The state of deterioration was made abundantly clear in 2007 when the Interstate 35 West Bridge in Minneapolis collapsed, plummeting more than 60 feet into the Mississippi River. 13 people died and 85 were injured. When a bridge goes down, you can work around it. But when a dam fails, it can drown a city. It can drown people downstream with little in the way of warning. And so they truly are structures that we need to respect and invest in. Time is running out as the condition of the nation's dams continues to decline. By 2020, 85% of dams in the U.S. will be more than 50 years old, past their average life expectancy. We don't even properly maintain them, never mind making the investment of how we improve their capacity and allow ourselves as a nation to essentially go forward with the infrastructure we need. In 2005, the American Society of Civil Engineers issued a report card on the nation's infrastructure. Dams were given a D. Dams have always had a grade of D, starting with the first report card in 1998, in 2001, and also 2005. It's unlikely that grade is going to change unless some significant changes happen in the nation. That is, dam safety programs in the states must be improved, and we must find a funding source to repair this growing list of unsafe dams. Age is not the only problem. As dam engineering becomes more sophisticated, Dams that were once thought to be safe are now being found to harbor hidden risks. In 1971, a major earthquake in California nearly collapsed the lower San Fernando Dam. Below the dam, more than 80,000 people were evacuated. For three days, engineers raced to reduce the reservoir's water level and prevent a full collapse. The event was a rude awakening, forever dispelling the belief that a well-built earthen dam could survive almost anything. Since then, assessing the seismic safety of dams has become a major focus for the Army Corps of Engineers. The Tuttle Creek Dam in northeastern Kansas was re-evaluated in the 1990s. Built in the 1950s to prevent flooding on the Big Blue River, it is an impressive 21 million cubic yards of rock and earth. But the impressive structure came up lacking in the area of seismic safety. The dam itself under normal operating conditions every day is perfectly safe. But under an earthquake scenario, we have a potential for the foundation under the dam to liquefy, the dam to spread and crack, and then eventually we have the potential for failure of the dam and release of the reservoir. Tuttle Creek Dam is only 12 miles from an active fault line. We believe that there's a potential to have earthquakes up to a 6.6 .6 magnitude, but any earthquake larger than a 5.7 has the potential to impact the dam and cause damage to it. To prevent this, the Corps has started a major project to strengthen the foundation of the dam. The effort is to put in what we call shear walls beneath the dam, and the intent of those walls is that they will be a foundation like piers under a bridge to hold the dam up through the earthquake and allow the dam to ride out the earthquake without movement. To build the 300 walls, engineers excavate trenches 65 feet deep. These trenches are filled with a mix of cement and clay, which hardens to form the walls. The walls actually have a strength somewhere between a soil and a concrete, so it allows the walls to move with the embankment. The remediation will take several years, and in the meantime, cities downstream are vulnerable if there is an earthquake. Our worst case scenario is we would have about two to six hours to evacuate the downstream community after an earthquake event. That puts about 20,000 people, depending on the time of the day, that would need to be evacuated to get out of harm's way. We have one of the most sophisticated dam failure warning systems in the world in place at the dam to protect the community downstream. Instruments in the dam measure the pressures inside and underneath. If an earthquake damages the dam, the evacuation alarm will activate automatically. The 
5.7 earthquake where we start to incur damage to the dam is what we refer to as an 1800 year earthquake. It has a 3% probability of occurring over the next 50 years. It's a low probability event, but it's a very high consequence event with the community downstream. So we take that risk to the community very seriously and felt we had to address that risk. Dams play a very important function in that we sometimes need to harness nature uh, to, to do basic things. But the challenges are still there that Mother Nature can throw a few curveballs. If ever there was a time that we needed to be truly investing in our infrastructure and in making sure it's durable, it's today. And our failure to do this puts not just us at risk, but puts our whole society at risk over time. National resolve to remediate aging and structurally unsound dams is the only answer. Across America, people are unaware of the potential dangers lying in the calm waters of reservoirs nearby. But in Kentucky, the citizens of Burksville can no longer maintain such ignorance. They've been warned. Upstream at the Wolf Creek Dam, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is racing to prevent disaster. The Corps recently declared Wolf Creek at high risk for failure. A dam break here would devastate communities along the river all the way to Nashville. The worst case scenario if we did nothing to this project is it would eventually fail. There would likely be loss of life downstream and certainly a lot of economic damages from the flooding. We estimate two to three billion dollars in economic damages downstream if this project were to fail. The mile-long Wolf Creek Dam was built in the 1940s to hold back the Cumberland River, creating Lake Cumberland. This 100 square mile lake is the largest Army Corps reservoir east of the Mississippi. Four million visitors a year come here to boat, fish, and hike along 1,200 miles of shoreline. The dam was originally authorized for two purposes. That was flood control and hydropower. But since that time, the recreation industry has really grown around the lake. Experts predict if the Wolf Creek Dam were to fail, in Nashville, more than 170 miles away, water levels would rise 40 feet in about four and a half days and peak in six days. For nearby Burksville, the situation is even more intense. The flood's full fury would be felt within 16 hours, achieving water levels 83 feet above normal. If we have complete dam failure, you know, Burksville would no longer exist. It would be washed away. I just think about what could happen. What would I do if the dam did break? If the dam were to break, everything downstream Burksville being probably the first major town that it would hit is going to be totally underwater and it's going to keep moving downstream. My farm will be affected and all the way inevitably into Nashville. The problem at Wolf Creek is 300 feet down in the rock underneath the dam. The dam itself is made of 10 million cubic yards of compacted earth topped with a concrete veneer. The riverbed it rests on is porous limestone rock. Over millions of years, water has carved a network of tunnels and caves in the soft limestone. It's what we refer to as a karst geology. The limestone has large openings in it, large caves, down to smaller size openings that are typically filled with clays and silts. The weight of the water in the lake creates pressure that acts to force water down into these openings. Water flowing under the dam can erode this material. And if a large empty cavity collapses, it could take the dam with it. To relieve pressure during the repairs, the Corps has lowered the lake by 40 feet. And there have been impacts to the recreation users with the lake drawn down. But it's important to note the driver for that decision is the life and safety of the downstream community. And that's why we're spending a little over $300 million at this project to get a timely fix in place. For the Corps, the first step in making the dam safe is to fill the holes in the rock. A simple idea, but an expensive process. The work that you see going on right now is the first stage of the fix, and it's grouting. And that's pumping cement, slurry, down into the foundation to plug any openings. It's not the first time the rock underneath the dam has needed repairs. The porous limestone was first addressed in the 1960s. A decade later, a wall was installed to reinforce the dam and control seepage. And now, a new concrete wall is being built behind the old one. 
It'll be much deeper and much wider than the existing barrier wall. And the purpose of that will be to block the openings in the rock that are allowing the flow of water from the lake to come under the dam. The potential for water from the lake eroding material under the dam requires constant monitoring. We have inspections going on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. People walking the embankment with a checklist and looking at the critical areas and critical indicators for signs of something that may be going on. An increase in wet areas downstream of the dam, depressions in the downstream slope or at the crest of the dam, muddy flow into the river. Things that would indicate water is moving through this rock and eroding material out of the foundation. As the work progresses, the dam gets a little bit safer every day. But those downstream still have to prepare for the worst case scenario, and the Army Corps is an active participant. We've held something on the order of 50 plus public meetings uh, where we come in, we give a presentation to the folks on what the problems are, uh, what we're doing to take care of them. In case the dam breaks, our plan is to evacuate the community, everybody that's in the flood area, as quickly as possible. Emergency manager Harvey Graves is the man responsible for keeping Burksville 23 miles downstream and its nearly 1,800 residents safe. And precautions are already being taken. The town's emergency management center has been moved to higher ground at the local hospital. Weather radios have been handed out. Reverse 911 has been installed, and they will soon have warning sirens. If the dam were to break, the river would begin to rise within hours. The flood would peak a day and a half later with water levels 56 feet above normal. Downtown Burksville would be underwater. It's very serious because you know, a lot of your communication is going to be cut off. You know, I'm one of the ones that they will call down in my end of the county that will help see that everyone gets out. And we will do the best we can. I am a teacher at the elementary school and we have drills that we perform each year that we practice loading the buses and taking the kids out of town and we will go to the next town which is in Clinton County. When it breaks, night or day, weekend, all of those are going to be variables in how you would respond. Uh, is school in session? Is school out? Is it in the summer? Is the river up or is it down? I try not to make a big deal about it. We don't want to terrify the kids. We just let them know that they're safe. It's a serious situation that we need to plan for. We're doing everything humanly possible to prepare. They have done very well about trying to make the public aware of everything. Any plan is better than no plan, but I don't think that you could be prepared for something like this. A flood could cause more than 300 miles of destruction along the river and affect tens of thousands of people. Most people here will tell you their only choice is to prevent it from ever happening. Are there any guarantees? That's an interesting question. There are no guarantees. These are man-made structures. We are doing a state-of-the-art fix here. We believe that this will take care of the problems at this project and take care of them for a long time to come. The problems at Wolf Creek were due to a lack of knowledge of the underlying geology at the time the dam was built. Engineers are still learning how nature can impact dams. The Hills Creek Dam above Eugene, Oregon, opened in 1962, was well built and is well maintained. Its design also reflects the limitations of contemporary understanding of the area's underlying geology. Since it was built, seismologists have determined that this part of Oregon is much more likely to experience a serious earthquake than was previously believed. Now, many are left to wonder, what would become of Hills Creek if an earthquake were to strike? It is a question more of when than what if. There is no question that there's going to be big earthquakes uh, that are going to occur in Western Oregon. What it comes down to is whether or not these reservoirs have enough strength to withstand these earthquakes. In these mountainous regions, with earthquakes come landslides. In a rainy season, this deadly combination could be enough to breach the dam and empty the reservoir within an hour. 
Nestled in a valley along the Willamette and Mackenzie Rivers in the heart of Lane County, Oregon, the metro area of Eugene Springfield is home to almost 350,000 people. Linda Cook is responsible for keeping them safe. We've got a long list of hazards when you consider the geographic diversity in Lane County. We are primarily concerned about flooding because of the numerous waterways that we have here. So flooding is the number one concern. Eugene lies in the shadow of eight different high hazard dams, all of which are run by the Army Corps. The majority of the water is held back by a series of three dams on the middle fork of the Willamette River. Dexter Dam is about 17 miles above the city, followed closely by the Lookout Point Dam, and finally the Hills Creek Dam, approximately 45 miles upstream of Eugene. Because of those dams, we're able to monitor the river levels, and we work closely with the Corps to make sure that those dams are protecting us from flooding. These dams were well designed and are well maintained, and yet there's a chance that one or more could fail. Those dams were built a long time ago, based on the knowledge they had at the time. But we've since learned that they're not up to current seismic standards. So they are vulnerable to any type of significant earthquake. Uh, the scientific knowledge is evolving. It's a moving target. For many years, Oregon was actually thought to be almost totally a seismic, believe it or not. Up until the early 1980s, people thought very few earthquakes occurred in Oregon at all. Now that we've uh, mapped faults, we've got plenty of information that suggests that lots of earthquakes occur in Oregon. Not only is it prone to earthquakes off the coast, the magnitude 9 subduction type earthquakes, but it's also prone to earthquakes uh, having magnitudes up to six or six and a half that occur inland. With knowledge of potential seismic activity in this region comes the realization that these dams could face a threat that wasn't considered 50 years ago. And these dams are all primarily embankment dams. They're comprised of generally a impervious clay core, which is surrounded by other zones of gravel and rock to uh, add stability and strength to them. These dams were designed for those kinds of conditions that we knew about in the 50s and 60s. The Hills Creek Dam was built in 1962, and at a height of more than 340 feet, it's the largest of these dams. I think it's a very safe dam. It was well constructed, it's been well maintained, it's been well monitored. We continue to monitor it on a, on a very consistent basis. Whenever you have the built environment interface with the natural environment, there are no guarantees. Nature does have a mind of its own. There's always the unknown, and there's no way to predict when or if something's going to happen. Many of us like to go through our lifetimes believing that it's not going to happen to us. One thing nature can be guaranteed to bring in this part of the country is rain. The potential for prolonged rainfall to fill the reservoir, placing a strain on the embankment, exists at Hills Creek. If, in a perfect storm of adversity, an earthquake of 6.5 or more were immediately to strike the region, Hills Creek might be compromised. A seismic event could damage the integrity of the embankment, assuming that you had a full reservoir. Once water would start to compromise that embankment and flow through, well, you'd lose the dam in a, a fairly short order. The probability exists, but it's very, very minimal. While heavy rain or an earthquake might be factors in a potential dam collapse, geography may play a part as well. The hilly terrain near Eugene could exacerbate the threat with the potential for landslides. You can have a landslide actually go into a lake. A lake uh, could then have a wall of water go over a dam. It can be incredibly destructive. This is a scenario that uh, I admit is, is relatively remote, but we have so many dams and we have so many places that have landslide potential or earthquake potential that sooner or later, it seems to me that something like this is a very real possibility. Sometime in the future, a week of extremely heavy rain engulfs Eugene. Suddenly, the constant sound of water gives way to a lower, more ominous rumble as a 6.5 earthquake shakes the community. It's over in a few seconds. The valley suffers only cosmetic damage, but in the mountains, the quake has unleashed a series of landslides. Waves created by the landslides in the swollen reservoir rush toward Hills Creek. The dam is easily overtopped, and the water furiously scours the earthen embankment. In a matter of minutes, sections of the dam collapse, 
a monstrous volume of water explodes from the mountains. If Hills Creek, Lookout Point, and Dexter all failed consecutively, we would lose about 800,000 acre feet of water. That's one acre of water, one foot deep, um, times 800,000. It's a lot of force, and it would be moving very quickly. This is a never-never event, and we don't predict this, but this is what would have to happen here. Dam's going to break open. We can probably empty Hills Creek Dam in two or three hours. People live in valleys, so when the dams break, huge numbers of people are at risk from these sorts of uh, these sorts of catastrophe scenarios. If we have something catastrophic, like all of these dams collapsing, and we get this massive wall of water into this community. Lives will be lost, businesses will be shut down, homes will be lost, schools will be closed. We could be looking at trying to evacuate up to 250,000 people. We expect that we would probably experience a thousand deaths in, in that type of situation. The surge would hit Eugene five to six hours after breaching Hills Creek and would peak an hour later. You're going to see water that extends basically through some of the most developed and some of the oldest portions of town. And uh, how deep is it going to be? Could it be 10, 20, 30 feet deep? This town here is in a bowl so that the water is going to be constricted and it's going to build up to relatively uh, high depths. One thing we, we do have going for us in a flood scenario in terms of dam breaches, we have prediction capability to know that these floods are coming. We have emergency notification processes in place to notify counties and populations downstream. So there's preparation for at least evacuating people in this kind of scenario. We're going to do the best job we can. We're going to activate all of our warning systems. We're going to deploy as many first responders to the streets as we can. We're going to bust our butts trying to make sure that we save lives and protect property, but it will not be enough. A small incident can overwhelm our local resources, overwhelm our first responders in our hospitals. I can't even imagine what a catastrophe would be like. Though cataclysmic in its effect, Eugene's flood is not a long duration surge and moves through the city in just over three hours. It would be tragic. It would just devastate our infrastructure and rebuilding an infrastructure is not something you can do overnight. It would never be the same place again. Billions of dollars in damages and thousands of lives lost is the ultimate cost in our attempt to control nature. While human progress compels us to exercise control over natural forces, we're obliged to be aware of the risks and respect our limitations. I don't think perfection exists. Absolute perfection doesn't. We, uh, we certainly deal with managing risk. We can't eliminate risk. It's incumbent upon us to recognize that to take it very seriously and to manage it well. Dams, if you're gonna build them, have to be able to handle a large flood. In some earthquake areas, they have to be able to handle a large earthquake. We have a responsibility, along with the dam owner, to make sure we don't see events like a flood or an earthquake that will cause the dam to fail. I think we have a long way to go before we actually understand what the hazards to cities like this really are, where the hazards are coming from, where the landslide hazards are coming from, where the earthquake hazards are coming from. We have to know which reservoirs are in the most danger. Wherever we have these structures, they have to be maintained, they have to be monitored well. They do represent opportunity for problems. As our infrastructure gets older, we need to repair it. We need to pay attention to it. We need to update it. Our goal is preparedness, and study has shown time and again that those that are prepared and have a good plan